Um, so today I will present a study that is ongoing and I will warn you that the numbers that I will show probably will be revised and calibrated and, and reassessed. We're about in the middle of the project, which is the second consecutive project that we did the first one on assessing economic potential of Utica Shale two years ago, where we concentrated on the, downstream uh, on the upstream opportunities and just touched on midstream. Uh, we were asked by the state and um, multiple economic <coughs> development constituencies to look at the midstream and downstream opportunities, and of course we could not do that without revising our estimates and assessing the pace of development of Utica in the uh, um, upstream industry. So I will just touch on the upstream industry current development and what is going to happen about in the five years, and in some slides I will show the longer projections that we are thinking how the, the economics of Utica will unveil. I'll uh, show you some preliminary research on production type, decline curve, and uh, so far as I know, this is the first draft of the decline curve for Utica, which is still a very de desired data for producers and midstream, and of course, downstream opportunities. Uh, I will talk about the, um, some company strategies and some other factors that are influencing how the Utica will be developed. And I will show you the midstream updates and projections for NGLs, which is critical for people who are asking questions about is it enough ethane in the area, is it enough for the long term. And I will talk about some downstream opportunities, touching on some economic and time mismatches, which I think people ask Tom, and I will provide some it's not an answer, but it's some thoughts to how you can approach and answer that for yourself. Um, in terms of the production analysis, um, all of you are very well aware that Utica made on the list of shale plays first time in August that are tracked by the U.S. government, which is a recognition that Utica is not anymore an addition to Marcellus, but it's a very important economically a shale play itself. And as of now, I want to emphasize that we've talked here a lot about the uh, NGL's uh, production of Utica, but Utica is equally split about now for, uh, between the production of the dry gas and the gas liquids. Uh, this analysis is done uh, or led primarily by another team member, and I have here my ally Andrew Thomas, who is the, another uh, member of the research team. Uh, but the analysis of upstream is led by the professor of Youngstown State, uh, Dr. Jeff Dick. And what he did, he looked at the data that are publicly available at ODNR, and he looked at the five quarters of 434 wells, and he took into account this data to produce projections for the next five years and to draft the decline rate based on the data available. Also, since Utica is still very new, uh, we're talking here about the great opportunities for downstream, but don't forget that Utica is only probably a third year down, while the other share plays are more than decades in development. <coughs> we're about on a third year where Utica is unveiling. It's still very new. It still requires a lot of infrastructure to be built, and that's going to dictate how the next five years, and I'm talking about five years, and people are asking questions about 10, 15 years, and I would say that we can guess here very well, but unless we live through these five years, we will know better and better when the Utica will be built during these five years. What are the exact opportunities for downstream? Uh, we're also looking at the similar planes, a place uh, to establish the decline curve and um, some other specific factors that influence in this. So, this is the, about the August data on the uh, different times of production that is going on in Utica. We have gas, natural gas liquids, and condensate of what is also call, uh, called a light oil. And <clears throat> you see here the points of the wells, and based on those points and production data, this is kind of a map that shows you where the main production zones showing that main wells or, or the lion's share amount of wells drilled right now and producing is in NGL zone. 
and in a dry gas zone. Uh, and also, if you take the production data and turn them into the, uh, what is the uh, kind of a, a matrix that industry uses to compare shale plays, which is a barrels of oil equivalent. And these are data are per quarter since the data were gathered on a quarterly basis from ODNR. You can see that the productive area is also primarily in a gas and natural gas liquids play. Um, another way to approach this and to estimate how serious the Utica play is and how to assess the scope and the potential for this play for the future is to look at the productive acreage. Um, right now, the total gross productive area is estimated almost at the three and a half million acres. And that's a productive acreage, which means that potentially can be drilled for the product. As of now, 116,000 of acres are drilled only. And this is about three and a half percent. This is based on a 640 acreage drilling unit that is reported as an average drilling unit assembled uh, at ODNR. Based on, on this data, uh, for yourself, you can answer a question which people always ask about the Utica. How long do we have this to unveil? And how much production, how much product will we get from Utica? And again, this testifies that we are at the very beginning of Utica development. And we have just a hint what product Utica has. Um, this is not means for you to read this data. This is just to show you a one single number that based on the production data, and the data were chosen very, very carefully. Out of 464 wells that are producing or reported to ODNR as producing, only 44 wells were qualified for assessment of the decline curve because only 44 wells produced 8% of their time since they were taken into production. So all other wells are producing much significantly less than 80%, which means we can consider that as a test of very initial production that does not always reflect uh, ultimate recovery from the well or the rate with which the well will produce. The other factor I want you to consider, you see in the newspaper all this good news about the single wells per individual companies, and you need to understand. The companies that are drilling in Utica, so is in other places, they have enormous Wall Street pressure of showing specific results. And few companies are taking a step back at this point, especially in Utica, and saying, well, we need to think about the long term. They need to balance within their strategies the availability of investment and um, kind of the, the gaining confidence from their clients and the ultimate recovery from the wells they're drilling, specifically in Utica. And only a few companies have courage to do that, and these are companies that are in a good financial state. So when you're looking at this exemplary results on the single wells, just be realistic read some Wall Street reports, look at the company's financial results, and, and then you can see, because technologically, you can gush a very high production in a very <coughs> stage of production of the well, but you may harm the ultimate recovery of the lifetime of the well. So at this point, we are pleased to say that the companies are stepping back and they are looking at the long-term production of Utica, and they're not any more so worried about the investment that will be made in Utica. Um, they're pretty confident about that. So the results of 44 well, uh, wells uh, production was taken to the analysis of decline curve. And not surprisingly, the data was showing that Utica wells are declining for the first year at about 65% rate, which is very consistent with Marcellus Shale number. The consequent years, year two, three, and four, there's not enough data available yet to establish the tail of this decline curve. So this data were taken 
with a precision looking at other shale plates. So in this graph, we can say that only the first year is the number that is derived from Utica wells. To look at the, what it means for the ultimate recovery from Utica, another analysis was taken. The variables that were included in this analysis was, was the rake count, which is another number that is used to be reported and tracked in a, in a um, pace of development of different shale plays. So right now, on average, and right now it's back to about August data, there was average of 46, 47 rigs in a play, and we academics, we like to stay conservative. We're saying if the rig count would increase to about 50 rigs, and will stay that way, if we take into account also improved time, which is called spot to spot, which means from the drilling rig to be moved and start drilling one well to start drilling another well, which includes the time of drilling and actual operation plus time of movement break between the wells. And that spot time is down to 20 years from about 30 to 35 years, about a year or two years ago. So the spot time is decreasing. We took into account this improved spot time. We believe that Utica will be taking into production about 850 wells annually if everything goes as it's going now. Production, spot time, and number of rigs. And taking this amount of wells to the account a year, most likely the estimated total annual production would be at 453 million barrel of oils equivalent. I will urge you and warn you not to multiply this by oil prices, even the decline in oil prices. Because as you know, there's a huge difference between oil prices and the gas prices. This is just to understand the scope of the play. Um, another analysis that we looked at was who are the main players that are now significant in Utica development and will they change for the next five years? And what is their strategies towards Utica? Because as we know, multiple companies are drilling on multiple shell plays and they have their internal strategies, how they divide resources between shell plates. So we identified seven main Utica operators that, that drilled about 80% of wells that existed in the Utica right now, including permitted wells. And uh, of course, among the seven, the leading place is still by Chesapeake, which has on average eight rigs operating in the Utica. <coughs> And um, it has probably, not probably for sure, the largest uh, acreage that is leased. And we looked at their strategies, how they're looking forward at Utica, where their investment will go. Right now we know that Chesapeake had very good results in the dry gas. They aggressively moved to the wet gas area over the last year. And in their strategy is to unlock the oil window or condensate window. They're working on that and they're moving also towards West Virginia. Uh, they did strike a joint venture with Total and they have very uh, active relationship with Enervest, which is also known as EV Energy. EV Energy works in Utica only in joint venture with Chesapeake and we call them, they are more like opportunistic acreage holders and they may sell their acreage, depends on their state, so we count them together with Chesapeake as one deal. Um, also, Magnum Hunter created an analysis where they um, show a percentage of the acreage that company has vested in individual shale plates. So we look at the companies that are heavily vested in Utica and Enervest, since it's not big companies, was number one leverage, uh, re uh, leveraged producer in Utica, which means they have the highest acreage vested in Utica. However, we consider them operating together with Chesapeake, and Chesapeake is number four leveraged producer in Utica. And I again want to emphasize this is just calculated by the acreage and not by their financial share. Uh, the um, next, um, th this is where the Chesapeake wells are, and you can see the red dots, it's permitted wells, and you can see that they are going 
further out, they're exploring other windows and uh, they're moving out of their comfort zone and concentration of their wells. And it's also because they spun off their midstream company to Access, which was ac uh, acquired by Williams. And I think they have better financial state right now to explore Utica further on. Um, number two company is a gold port. They have seven uh, rigs operating in Utica. They are not in Marcellus, they're in Utica only. And they consider a full scale or full uh, extend midstream company as well, which means they're taking their product and they care how their product, uh, through what outlets it's processed, and um, who is taking the ownership of the product. I want to tell you that there are different models in this field who owns the product. Sometimes the producing company owns the product and uh, have a venture with the midstream operator on a fee basis, but sometimes the companies sell their product at the wellhead or part of their product at the wellhead. And we were interested primarily in the natural gas liquids. And again, there are two models that exist and they have equal significance in Utica and even in Marcellus. There are midstream companies that own the product, which means for the opportunities in downstream, we're looking who is capable of striking long-term agreement for outlets for ethane, and that's an important question. So uh, this is the Gulf Fort Wells. Of course, they have much less, but this is the player that is very dedicated to Utica. And I know that Gulf Fort is drilling two wells to which many producers are now looking to as an example of doing research on how to best recover the product from Utica Wells. Um, this is the analysis of, of top seven top players in Utica, and you can see through several, qu several quarters, some companies are moving up, but primarily it's the same companies. What we're hearing from producers, these seven companies are likely to stay here, and we can see new companies entering the market or increasing their Utica shell. But these seven companies and their strategies are important for the region, and we're going to watch them. Another thing, if you look at these companies, besides Chesapeake, it's a midstream, com mid-sized companies. These are primarily companies, a few of them, HT Energy is from West Virginia, but other companies are from oil states, or from traditional oil states. They need that time to adopt in the Utica and create their supply chain here. But as it seems right now, they have no problems of engaging Utica labor and Utica contractors. Um, another piece of analysis was to look at the rig count, which is another popular number that is tracked. And for the long term, if you, the, the reports by uh, Baker Hughes is um, changing over time. It have changed from reporting uh, numbers by state to reporting numbers, or in addition, they now report number of rigs per shell plate. So uh, we just picked North Dakota also to show the state with a single shell plate. And we look regionally, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, what amount of rigs it had. And you can see that Pennsylvania's rigs declining, and we know why. They are moving regionally to West Virginia and Ohio to the wet gas plate. But you can also see that North Dakota experienced a similar pattern where they reached the kind of a, a largest amount and the number of rigs are decreasing. Again, this is partially due to improved productivity per rig. And um, another issue that we want to uh, research here is the timing. The Utica shale, if you think that when the area, when the um, land was leased, is approaching a timing of end first leases. And we wanted to see whether we're gonna see any increased activity to realize some leases that were leased for five years, although we know that majority of leases have uh, a clause in their contract that they can be um, held for another five years, but we want to see if companies would want to realize to drill under some leases and kind of shake off some leases as not within their strategic interest. So uh, 
we hypothesize that it's a, it might be some increase of activity due to the end of period of first leases, but it's not going to affect significantly Utica development. And uh, if you look at the Utica compared to other place, Utica is equally, even by rate count, is equally split between the dry gas and the wet gas. And the regionally, if you look at the number of rigs within the Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio, it's kind of not going to increase dramatically. Um, throughput projections for Utica. Again, these are numbers that are, we're still working on and we are revising and we're looking at the industrial data and talking to the companies. But we'll look at some analytics and uh, Tudor Pickering, for example, in August released the report where they significantly <coughs> improved the Utica outlooks and they are assessing it at the 1.8.1 uh, BCF a day of natural gas, including their dry uh, and wet gas. And we kind of having data from the industry, how much is the wet component within the gas numbers. We are trying now to calculate from this high analytical projections, how much ethane would be in the area. And of course, the burning questions for many is, do we have enough ethane? And would, it, would we have enough for the long term? So the answer as of now that we are learning from producing and midstream companies and some high projected analytics is yes. That's a simple answer. The more complicated answer is, most likely it would be enough ethane even if we look at the projection and uh, increased pipelines and uh, processing capacity that it's planned within the next two to five years to take away ethane outside of the region, it would be still enough or surplus of ethane to feed at least three large crackers in the Appalachian region. And I'm saying large crackers because among the announcements now in the region, there are different scales of crackers. Some crackers like shell, and to some extent, Brazilian cracker are larger in size, and the other crackers are smaller in size. And I should warn you that you really should assess the probability of whether the cracker will be built or not, or which cracker will be completed first or not, by some numbers that are rarely published in a newspaper. For cracker to be built, and I think some of the earlier presenters said it's a fairly significant investment and it's a bad and a big risk, the, the investment company needs to have an assurance that the cracker would have a feedstock for the cracker for the long term, but they also have a takeaway of their product for the long term. If we are thinking what is the feedstock for the cracker, it's an ethane. So this assessment uh, belongs to kind of answering the first question, do we have enough ethane? But also, in answer is a question, how the companies producing, or midstream companies, whoever owns the product, owns the natural gas liquids, are gonna strike the contracts. So, so far we know that about 40% of required amount of feedstock for both crackers, Brazilian and shell crackers, are secured, which is a significant number. We don't know yet whether they have any security with take away their product, and I will talk a little bit later why. What is the major economic mismatch? But this is the number that I would rely more than on the newspaper ads about the deal about to be happened or even the site acquired. Because there are practices, world practices, that even Shell has a history of walking away from the half built crackers. So unless the investment or financial side of the deal have a security in the feedstock and takeaway, then it's a higher, or it testifies to the higher probability of that project to happen. So uh, Wood McKinsey also uh, have pro high projections for the natural gas liquids and natural gas. And again, the difficulty here is that the different companies a majority of companies kind of blend their projections. They just would broadly say natural gas accounting or including the natural gas liquids within their projection. And that's what Wood McKinsey is doing. Their combined Marcellus and Utica projections are at 18 BCF a day. 
and the Blue Racer, which is the uh, project of Cayman uh, with other partners, are saying about 20 BCF a day, and the current gas production they estimate at 13 BCF a day. So as you can see that the total combined wet gas production for Utica and Marcellus, and that's exactly how midstream companies and downstream companies are looking at us. They're looking at the regional production, especially, especially in the wet gas, is about at 9.3 BCF a, gas, uh, a, a day. Um, what are the other factors that will control this production? We look at the natural uh, gas prices and natural gas liquids and condensate prices. And you've heard here through some presentations how much hope and how much increased downstream industries are projecting in their production. So right now, which means for the next five years, we don't see the price to be a major factor in changing the path of Utica and Marcellus production numbers. However, even if the gas prices grow to the $5 of the next five years, it's not gonna change the game. But these prices are not gonna stay for the 20 years or 30 years. And this is a time period that is considered for downstream opportunities and particular for the crackers. So with increasing demand for the other products, for the dry gas, the price equilibrium will change and therefore the whole model of what's gonna happen in downstream should be built on multiple equilibrium models. Um, we're looking at the rate of liquid production and strategies for drilling and who are the main players and what their strategies are for Utica and to some extent for Marcellus production of natural gas liquids. And there is another issue of the stranded leases or a lease retention or renewal and avoid to unnecessary um, lease retention and unitization backlog. So far, companies are drilling on available acreage, but they will come to the point where there would be some stranded acreage and we see already some trade in acreages between companies and they're working very close together by putting units where they can drill right now. But there would be some time when the companies will kind of look at the stranded acreage. So far there were no, a single case in Ohio, there were a couple of filings, but not yet a case where the um, homeowner rules would be uh, superseded by the state. But that might be an uh, issue of the future time. And still, if I remember about a year ago, many speakers and many presenters were saying that 2014 will be a decisive year and it will show the Utica development by the pace of midstream infrastructure development. What we can say that during 2014, we can see that midstream gained the confidence in Utica full scale. So in this year, there are many projects that are announced and will be completed within the next two to four years. And we believe that's the time that is required to fully catch up by the midstream infrastructure. There are still many wells that are not producing because there are not good opportunities to take away the specific product from specific well. And I want you to understand that each company has a portfolio of wells and they look at the production from every single well. And they're doing their trades almost on a daily to weekly basis. And they're doing their projection on a weekly to monthly basis. And right now, many companies rejecting ethane, which means they're blending ethane with methane and send them down to pipelines as much as pipelines regulations allow them to include ethane in their dry gas. And the rejections is going to a full extent which means the region is, still has a, a surplus of ethane, but again, for how long and how this will change. Again, this is the gas prices, and you can see that within the next five years, uh, they might increase to the $5, but um, nobody's projecting higher than that. And um, the rate of liquids production is really good. I think Tom showed in his slide that the ethane uh, might take as much as 80%. As far as we know from producing and midstream companies, typical liquid makeup for Utica is at about 60% of ethane, 22% of propane, 
11% of butene and the 7% of high SCs. So even, and again, we are taking the most conservative number of ethane. 60% of ethane is a pretty significant number and accounting for the fact that a lot of propane is consumed locally, uh, specifically for heating, uh, it affects significantly the midstream decisions of what um, pipelines are gonna be developed. So um, we took into account some um, typical industrial calculation where the shrinkage is uh, assessed around the 30% for the wet gas calculation and the wet gas generate around five gallons per MCF of typical Utica liquid production. Um, so the companies are diversifying their portfolio. They're not staying anymore within a single window. And we've heard from industry that they are not afraid to move into dry gas window because Utica has some prolific wells in the dry gas window that even with the current gas prices make enough profit to still drill on the dry gas. Uh, pri and prices are improving. That's a questionable whether they're gonna stay this way for a long time. Some people are praying for the high winter. I am consumer, I want the mild winter and low prices. Uh, but uh, the condensate area is still the less developed there is an Enlink that had a presentation on the first Utica summit. Enlink is also among producers listed in Utica, but I believe they're selling their acreage completely, and they are moving completely to the transporting condensate. So what are the main midstream projects that are under consideration? Again, assessment by analytical companies and by midstream companies themselves was that we still need about 30 billion of investment to catch up with the midstream infrastructure just for Utica and some Utica and Marcellus project. The throughput projections that are made for 2020 are saying that within the two to four years window, the production from Utica and Marcellus in the natural gas liquids window are not gonna um, overwhelm the building of midstream infrastructure. Rephrasing that, I should tell you that the perception and the plans of midstream companies is that within two to four years, they will produce the takeaway capacity that will be sufficient for increase of the production within the two to four years window. So we will hopefully not have any more shortages by the midstream infrastructure. The main companies that are processing in Utica are Ekaiman with their big project of Blue Racer, Marquest, Nysource, and M3 or Momentum. Uh, midstream takeaway business, as of now, there are three major pipelines. It's an Atex, which goes to Texas and owned by Enterprise, and two Mariner East and West pipelines owned by Sunoco. And we know that Endlink is the or kind of looking at the expanding their share in transporting condensate. And um, we also looked at the summary of Utica processing capacity, and that's a not pipelines, that's a uh, midstream gas plants that are, some people call them deatonizer, that split or fracture the liquids to uh, specific um, products. And we looked at the existing and projected, primarily by 2020, some companies project by 2018, and we looked at these main players, and it seems that they are projecting sufficient midstream processing capacity. And together with this capacity, they are projecting increase of capacity of major pipelines. So right now, these three outlets are not engaged to the full <coughs> capacity, just for example, because the Mariner East is still under construction, and at the east coast, or very close to the coast, this pipeline is splitting to two pipelines. One, which is for propane, is gonna be completed um, according to the company information by the fourth quarter of this year, and for ethane, is gonna be completed the first quarter of the next year. So the midstream is very dynamic part of the Utica development. 
I also want to show you that there is some declared rail capacity. We are hearing some um, hypotheses or some statements which we're still exploring on how much the rail capacity can be stranded or needs to be developed to accommodate all Utica products that will be railed. And we believe that primarily ethane will be piped from the area or within the area and other high seas would be railed or trucked within the area just because there is not enough other liquids uh, that will worth the pipelines, at least as of now. Uh, the new pipelines under consideration, we know that the Williams big project, which was called Blue Cross, was scrapped just simply because there is no need to transport a whole blended natural gas liquids. They're split to fractions right now, and there is a need for clean product pipelines, which means for ethane pipeline primarily. And the Kinder Morgan and the Marcella, Texas pipelines is proposed for 2015. And again, when we look at the total capacity as of now and the projected capacity, it seems that within the short period of time, which again, we assess at two to four years, there would be enough pipeline capacity to take ethane out of the region. And the next project would be if this ethane will be taken away from the region, would we have enough to be left in region, uh, produced in region for the crackers that are to be built in the region? And again, the short answer is yes. The midstream companies are projecting that there will be enough ethane that will be taken from the region to existing petrochemical hubs for the processing and would be still enough to feed at least three big crackers. Uh, there are some projects that are announced on the oil and condensate. Marathon Refinery announced uh, expansion, and uh, there is an upgrade in Canadian refineries. Some refineries, many refineries, are switching, and crackers in Canada, switching from naphtha to um, ethane. And again, uh, the big question is what crackers will be built in the area, whether they will be built, and who, who will build fir first. I think there is enough excitement around these questions, but I want you to take a step further on thinking about some specifics, uh, on specific factors, what needs to be done for this project to happen. Yes, especially two projects, Otterbreck and Shell uh, Crackers, are not only announced, but the sites are acquired, and they are within different stages. There are six or seven stages, uh, and about stage three or four is what is called no return stage. Neither of this company is at the stage which is a no return point for the cracker to be built. So I will not talk about Appalachian Residence and other announcements. I consider them as of now as announcement, and that doesn't qualify it for me as the project that will happen here. So Otterbreck and Shell, they do secure, and they're working very aggressively on securing the feedstock for them. But they're facing some other um, challenges. They're not obstacles, but needs to be worked out in the region. The big project for them is to secure a pipeline that will take ethane from processing or deethanizing plants to their facilities. And both companies want this pipeline to be built for them whether it would be by midstream companies or whether it would be for other investors, but the pipeline projects are not part of the cracker projects. And without this pipeline, the cracker will not be built. There is another problem that you might have heard about, but again, we don't know. We're still researching how to approach this and, and how to consider that this is a resolved issue. There is not enough and not sufficient storage for ethane and uh, that exist in the Gulf Coast and in Texas. So what we hear in that the pipeline, so-called pipeline, pipeline redundancy is a substitute for building a storage facility in uh, Midwest. Again, we're still exploring that because the redundancy generally um, means that you need to have multiple access to a pipelines on both ends to the feedstock pipeline, so not only ethane pipelines should be or should exist from the processing plant to the cracker, 
but also crackers should be connected to the major intrastate pipelines in case if they, because they don't have storage, in case they need additional ethane to be supplied as a feedstock, they need to have access to purchase that ethane from outside of the region. We also heard that there is possible to store ethane in a pipeline. It's not the most efficient way to store ethane and substitute storage tanks, but it's technologically possible. They also need to have outlet pipelines because both companies are considering not only selling all their product within the region, but also exporting their project. And both plans announced, they, as Tom said, they will make a, a whole chain. They will transform ethane to ethylene and ethylene to polypropylene. And polypropylene uh, is a pallets that are very easily transportable. Uh, but they also can transport or can um, sell other types of products. And in this case, they're looking for export venue, export capacity, export road, if you will. So all this project are under consideration by both companies. They're working with all other businesses that relates to this project. And um, it's still not done deal. And I want to, just for you to convey the message that this is a very dynamic field, very changing, but neither cracker in the Appalachian region is at the no return point, or we can guarantee that it will be built. <coughs> What are other relevant facts for downstream opportunities? Um, I've talked about part of this facts already. So instead of the scraped Williams bluegrass project, now the ethane pipelines are considered. Uh, the propane most likely, or at least of now, the pipelines are not on the projections, but they will be trucked uh, and railed, and that capacity of takeaway propane should be considered. What is important for downstream other than the feedstock? It's uh, also the um, connection, redundancy, access. I think I talk about all of this. Uh, what also important for them is the cheap energy. So they're gonna consume not only uh, ethane as a feedstock, they're looking for cheap energy, which is both electricity and methane. And um, I think yesterday there was an announcement on Philly, uh, Philadelphia refineries that they don't have a pipeline from Marcellus dry gas and they would like to get that pipeline as well. So um, they are looking for continuing and growing supply of ethane. Uh, on average, the feedstock for crackers is lasting for 15, 10, 15 to 20 years. And this should be contract that guarantee a certain amount of ethane to be delivered. And again, this is some legal challenges that should be overcome, but we know that Range and Ontario already made a long-term commitment to cracker companies and securing the significant amount of ethane as a feedstock for these companies. And also, um, on the other uh, end, they need to have a takeaway of their product as a feedstock for following chemical industry. I warn you about this slide, again, not to read. You can find this slide at the Department of Energy. However, I want you to appreciate a very high complexity of all end products that can be made from oil and from natural gas, which is the shale gas. So very rarely and very limited number of products can be made just from polyethylene. Polyethylene is just one of the components for the chemical industry. Uh, but they use a big variety in the inventory of chemical and compounders and, and uh, intermediary uh, companies is a big inventory of these chemicals, and they take this product from what is called commodity markets. So Tom mentioned at the beginning of our summit that uh, in, a, in a Gulf area, 70% of the product are sold among chemical companies. So to some extent, this is inevitable, because another thing I want you to learn, and this you can read, between the shell gas and the final consumption or final consumer or industrial product, there are several layers of how this product is changed and what companies and what type of industries are involved in the change of that product. 
there are two, at least two layers of companies that are called primary and secondary commodity chemicals. And for people who are not chemists, like me, I'm an economist, they look at this and, and we economists will say, well, this is a commodity market. For the commodity market, it's largely insensitive from what producer I'm taking that commodity. I'm just buying it on the overall commodity market that defines the overall price. What I will be sensitive to, probably a transportation cost, but it doesn't seem to be a big issue as of yet. Then intermediaries or another companies that are called compounders, they buy these markets from a many commodity markets and they create a chemical solution for specific uh, plastic products. So just for you to understand this couple of layers, I want you to consider a few other facts. So we, we looked uh, until now to the supply side of the market, how much ethane we have and how much product we can make at this. But as economists, we'll, we like to look from the other side. What is the consumption and how the consumption and consumer capacity will be growing over the next years? So the known fact is that in energy and plastic products, the consumption is growing at the GDP plus rate. And as you know that uh, the projection for GDP is not in a double digit numbers. It's a single digit. So the, the mystery is in a plus. What this plus means and how big this plus can be. So location of companies, which are commodity uh, market, on the commodity market, chemical companies, is looks like they're insensitive to where the cracker will be located. As far as they get the same price from the cracker in the Gulf Coast, they're gonna buy from there because they have already relationship with those crackers. So what is the mystery? Why the, the crackers should be built here and why uh, commodity chemical companies should buy from the local cracker, especially considering that chemical companies keep inventory not larger than the one month supply. And that's another challenge. We're talking about the cracker that at best is five to seven years away. The cracker that is not yet at the return point to be built. And they need to secure it take away, which is five, seven years from now, with the companies that buy inventory for one month. That's a big challenge. And you need to put yourself in the shoes of the manager of the chemical company, why they need to expand and make this decision now for something that is at best would be built five years from now. That's a big mismatch, what we call time and economic mismatch, which needs to be resolved. So what is the attempt and how it can be resolved? And what are the appeals that can be used to help resolve this question? So there are different time periods that we need to consider and different economic equilibriums that should be considered for the long term. And um, I would say that at best, we need to consider uh, different time periods and uh, during different economic time periods, there were different advantage that should be considered for long term solution. So the first concern for long-term solution is the price of ethane. Right now we have surplus, and as we know from the industries, ethane is sold below the floor prices, which is not gonna stay long. As soon as the midstream pipelines will be built within this four, two to four years, the ethane prices are gonna increase. So this price is not gonna stay for a long time. And uh, we also know that at least since cracker is five years away, this mismatch between taking ethane outside of the region and creating an obligation for 10 to 15 years with a cracker, it's still to be worked out by the cracker companies <coughs> with help of, of producers and midstream companies. So by now, I believe everybody uh, realized and gained the confidence that it's enough ethane in the region for a short and mid-term to secure both outlets, feeding the crackers and taking some ethane outside of the region. But again, what is the competitive advantage? What is the appeal on which this long-term solution can be made? 
There are different time periods. Within the short run, we see that uh, it could be transportation advantages. If you think about the ethane to be held down to the cost and then polyethylene or, or, poly or ethylene to be, again, returned to the region back in a, in a form of the commodity chemical, there is definitely a transportation cost saving. But the key question is, who is gaining from that transportation savings? Who is the main beneficiary of transportation savings? If Cracker is making all this chain from ethane to polyethylene, apparently they are the biggest beneficiary for transportation cost. And the question is, would this advantage to be passed further through the chain of their consumers? Well, we hypothesize the answer yes, because it's on their best advantage to pass, at least on a short run perspective, a part of this cost to their consumers, first to establish them on the local market and gain the share regionally. Uh, the midterm, short term to midterm, we believe that logistic advantage will be here, and that's what Tom was talking about. We do looking at the rail um, kind of transportation logistics and just overall logistics. There will be no backlog <coughs> bottlenecks that exist in the Gulf area. So we believe this could be a midterm advantage. And the long-term strategy, we believe that advantage could be developed through a concept of building the cluster that will start with cracker or even with the feedstock of ethane cracker and then passing the product from the cracker to end users. And as always, the, the devil is in details. It's needless to say that um, there are low density and high density uh, polypropylene, but even within the each density of polypropylene, there are more than 100 different products that can be developed. So it's only on a first look for economists like me, it seems that it's a very unified commodity product. But in reality, and I think Tom mentioned that very well, and he's the chemist, it was probably a good question for him, but all these crackers and chemical plants, they tune their product very finely. And what we've heard, that the chemical product that can be used for producing cosmetics is very different from chemical product that can be used in producing plastic parts for the car. Although the combination or or percentage of, of the chemicals that exist in both could be very similar. But the, this specifics, these details, can be established as an attractiveness within the regional cluster. So I have numbers a little bit older, months older than Tom had, but I can also show you that some companies are starting to realize that. And among the processing projects, which is within this chemical and compounder companies, there are lots of projects of expansion and new construction is already announced. And as you can see, the whole Midwest is in a very intense number. And Ohio is number three by the amount of project announced. And uh, that kind of gives a hope that um, the, the high C-suites of the chemical and compounding companies are thinking about this very proactively and building this future capacity. So some findings that I want to talk about are kind of condensed what I've talked in this, in this long presentation. But main thing I want you to take away from this is that we have players on the uh, upstream industry that are gonna be here for at least next five years and let's pay attention to them. Let's listen to what problems they have. Let's see if, if states need to help them with some unitization problems or just keep looking at their strategies and you will get better feel for how the Utica will be unveiled within the next five to 10 years. We believe that mixed midstream companies gain their confidence in Utica Play. They have enough already publicly announced projects that will take away Utica midstream shortages within the next two to four years. And we believe that exactly at this point, the ethane prices will increase because it would be much less rejection of ethane, which is going now. And the ethane will be taken away from this region as it is taken away now to a full extent, to a full capacity that exists for takeaway of ethane now. 
uh, the downstream opportunities rely on the fact whether a cracker or crackers will be built in Appalachian region. I like to share Tom's optimism, but I'm a scientist, I'm academic. I like to have a proven fact until I say, yes, for sure it's gonna happen. Right now we believe that no cracker is at the stage of the no return point. And I would hesitate to answer which cracker will be built first because we might end up with no cracker to be built. It's a very pessimistic grim picture which is in the big contrast with previous speakers. I just want you to get real and, and know what is the state right now. We hopeful, we believe that cracker will be happening in our region but this will, the, the decision and this fact will uh, depend upon several factors, among which the main factors are whether the pipelines and redundancy of pipelines will be constructed regionally, and whether the cracker companies and investment companies will financially secure their deals on both ends of the cracker, as a feedstock and as a takeaway. I will be happy to answer your questions and I will warn you that this is a very preliminary results. We hope that our project will be completed by December of this year and we also working on the analysis of the labor force and projection of the demand for the labor force that can be created by this path of Utica development. Thank you, Irina. Uh, I'd like to ask you uh, um, the question that that's come to mind every time I've heard you speak. How difficult is it to get this kind of information from these companies if they don't have to report it uh, to their to their stockholders or to the government? And, and what sort of relationships do you have to build with them in order to get the information? Um, it is difficult, but right now the. Uh, I'll tell you it's a, it's a mismatch. It's much harder to deal with producing companies and for some reason it's much easier to deal with midstream companies. Fortunately, we are at the stage where midstream companies need a lot of investment. Majority of them are public companies. They are appealing to their investor with their investor presentations and we know that they should be very transparent in their investor presentations. But fortunately, the companies that we listed in our analysis, we spoke to most of them, 90% of them, and they were very open by sharing their plans and strategies with us. And um, I think that, that our first report is a good reference for us to open the door and for these companies to speak to us. And the second source is, I believe these companies gained the confidence and they passed the stage uh, which we were when we were doing the first report where companies were extremely secretive and they were in a huge rivalry even on um, securing their acreage. So I think it's a, it's a level of confidence that exists in Utica now that opens uh, companies with more data to us. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan, is there questions? Please, go ahead, please. I have a question. I'm Jim Shearer. It's on the topic of geology. Since all of this comes from the geology, I'm curious about some things and maybe you could comment. So we have the Marcellus in the Devonian, and we have the Utica in the Ordovician. There are other layers, the Geneseo and the Rhine Street. Are they coming online and will they come on more? I have heard that the um, Utica is about 30% the size of the Marcellus. I don't know if that's true. Maybe you can comment on the geology. And why don't we bundle up this whole shale stack and call it the uh, uh, a combination of uh, I don't know Marcellus and Utica, uh, the Marcellica, and say that the Marcellica is, lar is as large as Saudi Arabia. Tell this to governors of Pennsylvania and Ohio. <laughs> I would like to see how they would react to that. Well, in a way, this is a different place, although they're both on Devonian, but I think there are different places. So your, your question has a couple of layers. Uh, to your first layer, whether the other uh, geological horizons are considered, the answer is yes, and I know that in Marcellus, at least, they're considering now a multiple permits for multiple depth, and they want to benefit from some shallower Marcella wells and drilling them down to the next productive horizon. In this estimates, this 
other shells or other opportunities are not taken into, into calculations because there are simply not enough data yet. But I know for the fact that at least on Marcellus sh uh, shell in Pennsylvania, the, the double permits are already taken for multiple wells. Uh, to your next question, why uh, we don't bundle them up, I think uh, I, I already showed that we do to some extent, especially from the point of view of midstream and downstream opportunities. I don't know if it's productive to create a, a weird name. We're already used to Marcellus and Utica, and it's nice to have own identity. Uh, but uh, a majority of midstream and downstream companies are looking at the regional outcomes. And the cluster for downstream is considered specifically even in a larger region, it's a six to seven state area for downstream industries. Yeah, I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit more about the upstream dynamics. Um, I'm always asked the question, how long is the drilling going to last? When is it going to play out? And I looked at some of your slides, and they say 3.5% of the prospective acreage has been drilled. Then there was something that said that with 50 rigs, it's 850 wells a year, which is pretty similar to the amount of wells that we currently have. So does that mean that if we drill at 50 rigs per year, we've got a 30-year inventory? And on your projections, do you think that the rig count tops out at 50? because a lot of the operators like Eclipse or American Energy Partners have announced that they're increasing their rigs next year. What makes you think that it's going to top out at 50? Um, I talked and we based our calculation uh, obviously on a conservative end. And I think what saves us last, last time in our project that we were pretty conservative and, and we were right on the target. We projected 600 wells by the 2014 and we were absolutely right on the target. I think sometimes we like to be hyped on these numbers, but it's better to be on a conservative and say, this is for sure what we're going to have. Whether we will have uh, an additional rigs, well, there are two facts to this story. The one fact is uh, there is only amount of total amount of rigs that are floating around the region. And um, as we looked historically, there are not many rigs that are moved to the region. There are enough within the tri-state region. And the question will be only, what is the balance between dry and hot, dry gas in, Mar in Marcellus versus um, increasing rigs in wet gas or oil window? It will depend. For Utica specifically, and I mentioned that, only 44 wells are producing for 80% of the time over the last five quarters, and not this 44, all 44 wells came at the first quarter of this five years quarter. So basically, we have not enough data yet on the condensate window and oil window, and so is even on the gas window. Recently, we had wells that were much better than our first wells on the gas window. So I think we're still at the point where it will depend on further discoveries, and simply there are not enough wells, and you will be surprised, we have a thousand, but it's still not enough to assess whether all this other 90% of acreage is productive to the extent that the first three and a half percent are productive. So it might be not that we have 30 years, because on the outskirts of that acreage, the production might be not at the numbers that will justify the gas production at the $4. So again, it's all economic plays. As of now, we can pretty safely say that it's at least another 10 years. It's a, it's a safely 10 years. We're hoping it might be 20 or 30 years, but only the next three, five years will answer that question. Let's thank Irina Landolt for her research and the presentation.